I've been involved in the arts since I was a young boy. My family is steeped in the arts. My grandfather, Alan Freelon Sr., uh, was a noted African-American painter during the Harlem Renaissance period. In fact, the, uh, the museum here on campus featured his work. It's been about 10 years. And so uh, I was fortunate to come up in a family where arts, visual arts, performing arts, um, were, were valued and encouraged. So I, I was always painting and doing sculpture and building models. And, and I love the physical aspect of putting things together. And when I got to high school, I stumbled upon a, a drafting course, which had the drawing piece and the creativity, but it also had a, an element of science with geometry and mathematics uh, combined. And, and so it was, for me, the kind of perfect blend of the arts and the sciences was this thing called architecture that I found out about in high school. I would say that architecture is the, um, is the art of creating the built environment. So uh, the environment is everything around us, including the natural environment, but there's a lot of it that is um, made by men and women um, and designed with, with a conscious thought about the outcome. And so uh, I define architecture in that broader way. Uh, it's about the environment. And increasingly, there is the overlap of the built and the, and the uh, natural environment, which is a, a really important aspect of what we do. We want to make sure that uh, as we impact the environment, that there's a positive impact and not something that's detrimental to the natural uh, world. And so uh, more and more architects are focused on pr providing buildings that, um, yes, we utilize energy, but in some cases we can even be uh, carbon neutral or uh, net zero, which means that you're not using any more energy than you're producing in terms of the building. So that, that's sort of a lofty goal, but that's how one of the better ways that uh, architects and architecture can coexist with the natural environment. Well, the choices uh, are typically um, the client's choice of the architect and not the other way around. I, I wish we could say, okay, I want to do that project. I'm going to go design the Obama presidential library because that's what I want to do. Most often, uh, we are in a competition of sorts with other architects who would like to do this or that project. So the, the selection of the, uh, of the work is usually up to the institution or the client uh, choosing the architect. And so having said that, uh, there are some choices on our side. I mean, we, we made a conscious decision years ago to do certain types of projects, which led us to certain commissions and, and clients and you know, by definition away from other types. You know, building institutional buildings for college campuses, libraries, museums, uh, those sorts of things, uh, but not so much um, residential work. And so there are specialties just as you have in law or medicine. Um, you might have a cardiologist, he's not going to work on your feet, and, uh, nor uh, is he going to be concerned with uh, the, the, the elbow joint. Architects um, likewise have certain areas that they specialize in. We feel like the work that we do at the end of the day ought to be of benefit to the larger community. And that's sort of one measure of how we decide which projects to pursue. And so uh, because of that, you know, we find that working on college campuses or for um, public uh, clients uh, like municipalities and state government or for uh, museum uh, clients who, whose mission and vision is to enlighten people and, and share knowledge. Those are the sort of projects that we're excited about and that we would like to work on. We think that, again, when, when it's appropriate, that the building should be uh, expressive of what's going on inside uh, and expressive of the uh, mission and vision of the institution. And, and so what goes on in this building? Well, it's, it's research connected to the genome and, and bioengineering. And so we began to look at the uh, helical uh, formation of DNA. And one way to analyze that is, is unraveling the uh, helix and, and looking at the patterns in a, in a flat um, context such as you have on the west of the building. It's a, it's a flat building elevation. And it's subtle. It's not something that 
um, would jump out at you, but it, it's thought provoking and we feel that it's appropriate to this building. It helps tell the story of what goes on inside. In some ways, the ribbon cutting, you know, uh, the very beginning and the opening of the building is a, uh, a special moment. Uh, and it's filled with um, expectation and celebration. Uh, and certainly we, we want to be part of that. Uh, but we also want to know that over time the building is performing and meeting the needs of the users um, after the ribbons are gone and the cameras are gone and uh, all the politicians have taken their pats on the back for, for, for the building. And so we like to come back and do what's called a post-occupancy evaluation. Uh, because if you don't ask, there's no way to know how is the building performing and are the users happy um, or what can you learn from that experience that, that will make you a better architect and make the next building uh, better. So we like to perform a post-occupancy evaluation at 12 months after occupancy, which we've done here and we do it on many of our buildings, uh, not just to confirm that we've done a good job, I think you learn more from some of the missteps or uh, perhaps errors that have occurred so that you can apply that knowledge uh, the next time around. The idea-driven design uh, really um, is about listening again. And so, for instance, in, in Atlanta, we did the Center for Civil and Human Rights. And the idea there was about, you know, caressing the content. And so the building, it doesn't look like hands, but it's, a, it's, it's an abstraction or a modern interpretation of, of uh, this building sort of holding the precious content uh, and creating that space. So we, we, we think that buildings um, ought to be more than just beautiful wrappers or containers for what's going on inside. Well, we're very excited about a collaboration with uh, Perkins & Will. This is a global design firm uh, that we have merged with. And so this allows the Freeline Group and, and all of our uh, team a broader platform from which to, to practice. Um, in the prior 25 years, uh, everywhere that we've worked around the country, we've, we've partnered with a local firm, whether it's Chicago or Houston or San Francisco. Now we have a local partner in every major U.S. city plus uh, a number of cities abroad. And so what's next for us is to continue our, our growth and development uh, and exploration of this thing called architecture um, as part of this tremendous global organization called Perkinson World. Very excited about that.